Hello, everybody, and welcome to This Week in Birding and Nature Photography. Um, I'm Stephen Ramsden, your host, and we have a fantastic show this week. We're going to have our special guest is Catherine Dudek from the Chattahoochee Nature Center. She is awesome, and we will get into her awesomeness in just a few minutes. She is at work and properly wearing a mask. The rest of us are at home uh, and hopefully not needing a mask, but uh, this week, Pine siskins are everywhere in uh, the Atlanta area and all around the Southeast, I'm assuming. Um, this is the pine siskin, as you can see on your screen. Very similar in appearance to a house finch female uh, or a purple finch female, but these are the pine siskins and they have the little, the thin pointy beak, uh, as you see in this photo. And sometimes the males get a dark uh, cap on their head. But if you're wondering what is um, eating all of your food in your feeders and what is making this crazy sound outside, uh, it's the pine siskins, probably with their buddies, the starlings, who are also uh, all over the place right now. And I live in the middle of the city, so we have uh, dozens of starlings flying around trying to eat the house. I mean, they eat anything they can get in their mouth. And these pine siskins are all over the suburbs right now. So if you go to Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve um, and look at the feeders, you will see at least 30 of these on the feeders. And we went through three bags, three 20 pound bags of seed this week already for the pine siskins. And of course the, the chipmunks and the squirrels. But the weird thing is these uh, siskins have ran off all the other birds. The only birds brave enough to go in there is the occasional blue jay and a couple of blue birds now and then. And they even run off the chipmunks and the squirrels because there's so many of them. Everybody's like panicked, you know, I can't take this man, too many pine siskins. So I'm not sure how long this is going to last, and this is the most I've ever seen. They say we're having an eruption right now. Maybe Catherine can confirm that for us. But if you like pine siskins, uh, this is your time of the year. So what is uh, Sunlit Earth? Well, it's a nonprofit, and we talk about sunlight in nature. And my favorite subject is, is sunlight and different waves, uh, wavelengths of light, and we on the meeting with us now is Alexander Hart from the UK, who is the world's greatest solar photographer, solar astrophotographer. She is an accomplished solar astronomer. Uh, she is uh, in the medical field as well, a researcher. And we are great friends. We have visited and done solar astronomy together before. Um, Connie Corrali, which I know nothing about, except she's very friendly and a very good birder. She's with us also. And Connie and I birded together a couple of days ago, Clyde Shepherd, maybe it was yesterday. Um, and I got her name wrong twice and I apologize, but I now have it memorized. And of course, our favorite person ever in the Atlanta area is uh, Catherine Dudek. And Catherine, um, there will be some more people coming on the call and there may be some questions if you have time. And I realize that you're at work uh, doing, doing what you do. And if you need to go, then just go. Uh, some kind of an emergency. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but we're very grateful that you would you would take the time to be on the show. Um, I'm going to go ahead and highlight your screen. Hello, Rebecca. Uh, there we go. And what a lovely mask you have on. <laughs> Why, thank you. I have quite the collection nowadays. <laughs> and um, all you can see right now is Catherine's kind eyes. And let me tell you, uh, she is uh, a very, very friendly, wonderful person to know, very patient with people, <laughs> let's just say. And um, I had the, the distinct pleasure of, of going into the uh, treatment room where Catherine is at now at the Chattahoochee Nature Center and being able to watch her and her team of volunteers work. It's, uh, it's quite impressive. Um, I'm a military veteran. I've seen some, some things, um, but I could not do what she does because it would be too heart-wrenching for me. And um, Kat Catherine uh, is well-known in the area. Anytime anybody has anything wrong with any kind of animal, uh, the first person they text is Catherine. And uh, she has saved more animals in the area than I think uh, anyone ever has. And we are very, very happy to have her um, on the show. And how's it going down there today, Catherine? Uh, we're loving the beautiful weather. Uh, the volunteers are out uh, bird watching right now, looking for some of the, the migratory species. And it just so happens our exhibit building yesterday, uh, admissions radioed me because they had a bird that flew into the admissions area and couldn't find its way out. And I went down there and of course it was a female pine siskin. Yes, yes, of course. <laughs> awesome. Um, I uh, had a couple of pictures, if, if you don't mind, um, of, of 
my time that I spent over there with you, just a couple of highlights. And I really will never forget hanging out with you guys because I got to just get up close with some animals and see um, beyond the romanticism of everyone, you know, everyone wants to save animals. Everyone goes out of their way. And a lot of times they do the wrong thing because their intentions are to save wildlife any way they can. You know, every spring you get the people that try to get the fledglings on the ground and try to take them into rescue. And, you know, some people don't know the right thing to do. So I, I uh, decided I wanted to learn a little bit about the right things to do. So I was lucky enough to be invited um, over to where Catherine works and see a few things. And this photo here is uh, me helping with a black vulture, I believe it was. And Juvenile black vulture that had hydrocephaly. He's got that crazy bulge on the top of his head right there. Yeah. Right. I wish I could zoom in with this on Zoom, but we can't. But yeah, and, and uh, I learned some things that about how fragile the vulture's legs were, how to properly uh, pick the vulture up and hold it for an examination. And uh, it was just an amazing thing. And do you remember this little critter? Yes, uh, that little critter is having a horrible molt right now. <laughs> that is a gray-faced eastern screech owl that had been transferred to us uh, non-releasable due to a car collision and right. he lost his left eye. It had to be uh, surgically removed and the eyelid sutured shut. Right. And he was used, uh, she, I'm sorry, this is a female, uh, was used in education for many years before she passed of old age. And mm -hmm. uh, it was about six months ago she passed, but she yeah. ed educated and delighted thousands in her lifetime. Yes, with the size of that eye. Was just was shockingly large to me. <laughs> Imagine yeah. that another another screech owl with only one eye. Yeah, and is this the red screech owl? Yeah, this is the red faced eastern screech owl. This is also a female, and uh, she is actually out on a program right now. Mm. Yeah, you know I've only seen one of these in in nature, and it really wasn't even in nature. It was at an RV park. And, uh, you know, you rarely ever see these birds anymore, but I know they're still around everywhere. And I guess uh, the most common time to see them now, unfortunately, is after some sort of accident with a car or running with a screen or a window. And if I recall, this was a broad wing hawk. This is our male red tailed. Male red tail, I'm sorry. Yep. The, uh, the, with the exception of the vulture, the other birds, as well as this one, are permanent residents of ours that are injured and non-releasable. And we weigh them uh, several times a week uh, just to make sure that they're maintaining, especially when we have cold snaps coming, things like that. This male was another car collision. He was taken to, um, let's say a vet school at a university in Georgia. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm familiar with that. Identified him. <laughs> Yeah, they misidentified the species uh, by a long shot, and right. uh, he suffered a fractured uh, humerus right at the shoulder, and that is typically an injury that we as rehabilitators would humanely euthanize for right. because of where, where the fracture was in location to the function of the joint. Mm -hmm. And so they tried to repair the, uh, the wing, and unfortunately, were not able to and so yeah. we received him as a juvenile so he didn't have his red tail when we first got him 18 yeah. years ago and uh to this day he still goes out for programs however he can only lift that wing not even parallel to the ground because wow. of the callus formed from where the fracture was interferes with his movement in the, in the wing cool now there was a i know there was a broad wing there that day that is a juvenile Broadway yes. right there. And the reason I remember it so much is because it about made me deaf. It was so loud. <laughs> and I, I was able to go out on the perch outside and, and collect this bird and bring him in for an examination. And let me tell you, those thick welder's gloves um, are barely enough for, for work, working with this bird or any other animal you have out there. And I learned that day that uh, my Home Depot gardening gloves were not going to cut it. <laughs> no, heaven forbid you're a dragonfly around a broad winged. <laughs> So that bird was so loud and so small. And uh, when it grabbed my little hands, uh, I mean, it pierced right through the gloves I was wearing. So I, I learned that day, yeah, I got to get some better gloves. <laughs> but um, I, I also walked around. Uh, we, we had a little interesting experience that day too, where we went up the hill to get this 
raccoon out of a garbage can. <laughs> do you remember that? I do indeed. It was up by our unity guard <laughs> and uh, juvenile raccoon got himself caught in a trash can up there with uh, water in it, obviously. Yeah, was so that was a lot of fun. Um, there's something new every day, uh, uh, Catherine. And one thing I remember from, from uh, hanging out with you was how many people call the center and it's amazing how many people find bald eagles in their front yard. <laughs> <laughs> Peregrine falcons and bald eagles, every bird we get. <laughs> yes, and I'm and for those that don't know, everybody that calls a nature center thinks that they have an eagle in their yard and it could be anything. So um, I learned real quick also that someone calls and they have a, a, a cobra or something in their in their yard or they've got a, you know, some kind of horrible python or something. It could end up being a garter snake, it, you know, and Catherine, I always asked everybody, and, and I do now too, can you send me a photo? Because uh, that's, you, you, people unfamiliar with, with these wildlife species, everything's an eagle. Um, we went out on a call over in our, our neighborhood. Catherine, or Catherine lives near the nature preserve where I work sometimes. And we collected a barred owl one time, uh, right when I first started learning about rescue. And it was amazing to me how swiftly you just jumped in between these two fences, uh, scooped up this owl, gave it an exam, and, and uh, put in the anti-inflammatories, had it all done. I mean, it was it was maybe six minutes flat from you getting there to the bird being in a position to be transported. I was very, very impressed with that. Um, you do that. I've, I've had about two decades of experience. Yeah. <laughs> so, trust yeah. me, my first rescues were not nearly so swift. <laughs> yeah, um, I can imagine. I know mine have not been. Um, I, I, you know, I'm always scared. I'm going to hurt the animal or get hurt myself. Um, uh, how many times a, 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 a day or a week do you think that you go through this kind of thing? Well, we typically don't do pickups ourselves. That one was, of course, was pretty much right down the road from us. So, but we as the nature center don't do pickups because we are a staff of three, two of us full time. Uh, we have fewer than a dozen volunteers right now that have come back. We typically have more than that as well as high school and college interns, but with COVID restrictions and things like that, some of the folks aren't comfortable yet coming back and we can't have students here yet. But we, um, we just honestly don't have the manpower to do pickup because we receive from the general public and animal controls as well as Department of Natural Resources on average 650 injured birds of prey and injured reptiles every year, which is what we're licensed to rehabilitate. Um, so two to three a day. On average, <laughs> and uh, we were closed for 12 weeks during the, the height of the pandemic and weren't accepting any cases at all. And we still have, uh, as of the, the box turtle that came in earlier today, received 404 cases this year. Wow. We have 49 currently in care, um, a lot of them being reptiles, and many of them should be able to be released uh, in about a month or so, but that would be when they're in brumation, okay. so they will have to overwinter with us. And as I turn slowly, <laughs> all of the tubs behind me on that shelf have box turtles in them that are being actively treated and have things like upper respiratory infections, um, sutures, things like that. So we can't set them up in enclosures like these rehabbing Easter right. box turtles. Goodness. So <laughs> we even have a couple more that are at the vet right now that need some in-depth in surgery, some intense surgery. Um, but the wildlife department here is also in charge of all of the resident animals, some of which y'all saw in Stephen's photos. So Every, all of the animals we have on exhibit are injured and non-releasable and they're all native to Georgia, specializing in birds of prey and reptiles. So that includes about a hundred hawks, owls, eagles, vultures, falcons, yeah. turtles, tortoises, snakes, opossums, beaver. <laughs> Snapping turtles. Yeah. Turtles. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that uh, that uh, I'm in charge, that I oversee the care of uh, along with my staff and the volunteers. So. When Steven says no two days are the same, he is 100% right <laughs> on that. Well, let me, let me rephrase the original question. Um, you are also on call, uh, not officially, but uh, informally, because you love animals so much and you love nature and biology and, you're, and frankly, because you're such an accomplished rescuer. Um, 
you get calls every day, I would imagine, from people, uh, Facebook messages, messages from people like me. Uh, hey, there's this uh, eagle in my yard. What do I do? I mean, how, 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 often, how, how many of those do you think you would get in an average day? And do you take a day off from that where you just don't answer anything? Um, I, I'll answer that second one, that last question first. Um, I try. Um, I try yeah, to take a day off. Um, back when we used to actually be able to travel freely, um, to give you an idea how people are, it, part of it's my own fault because I have myself available, but um, we, my husband and I were in Pisa, Italy, and the phone rang and I looked down and it was our veterinarian, who is not only our reptile and mammal vet at work, but our personal dog vet. So of course I answered the phone because the dog was not with us in, in Pisa. And first words out of his mouth were, Catherine, so the box turtle that was dropped off earlier today, and I'm like, whoa, 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 I'm in, I'm in Italy right now. I, I, can, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm out of the country. Um, I know you talk to him anyway, though. I know how you are. <laughs> um, but Department of Natural Resources and U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, have my cell number because if they're doing undercover investigations, things like that, they want to call the licensed rehabber directly. Right. Um, and sometimes they're just in the area. For instance, uh, the head of DNR uh, permitting office uh, two, two uh, Mondays ago on my day off met me at the QT gas station right by the house to bring me an injured box turtle. Wow. <laughs> wow. I, do so... get, I, I try and keep the personal Facebook and the work, the work stuff separate, but right. personally through Facebook and text messages, I probably get two to three a day. Yeah. Um, at work, we average, this is our slow season, so we average only about 150 phone calls a month and about 250 emails. Oh, is that all? That's yeah. all. Each um, one with some kind of animal. Summer, <laughs> baby, that's uh, 500 phone calls a month. Well, after meeting you, I met you at the uh, Nature Preserve, I believe, with your dog, Roddy. And um, af after meeting you, I soon realized that every Facebook post in any of the uh, groups associated with the the neighborhood you live in and with my group they always say call Catherine Judith or they always tag Catherine Judith tag Catherine Judith and I really wanted to try to relieve some of that pressure and when I started trying to learn about it I realized right off the bat that there's no way without a decade at least of experience I was going to be able to to safely relieve any of that pressure but I am trying and I, I, I do want the help and you know that um what what kind of uh creatures I didn't realize it was that slow there and that you had been closed down that long for the pandemic mm -hmm. And I'd like to say this is the most free time I have ever seen in that clinic uh, where you didn't have something in your hand needing an x-ray or bleeding or something. So well, it must to be honest, we open at 10 a.m. and I got here at seven o'clock to make sure I got as much done as I could <laughs> before this. Now you have a, a whole other building there with all your rehabbing snakes and stuff, right? Yes. Yeah. The, a lot of the snakes are in another uh, rehabbing snakes are in another room. Um, this is the clinic itself. So this actually isn't open to the public. And I was able to get special authorization right. from the Department of Natural Resources and U.S. Fish and Wildlife to have Stephen come in and shadow us that day. Um, because as he can attest to, this place can be a little bit like Grady Hospital on a Friday or Saturday night. Yeah. And when he says that there are definitely some things that are <laughs> disturbing. Um, disturbing, yeah. For sure. With, I promise I won't go into gory details, but one of the cases we had come in yesterday was a box turtle that had been hit by a car, which we see that frequently. Um, there was a shell fracture. We see that frequently. Um, unfortunately, the fellow had had the box turtle for two weeks. Oh, my God. And he thought that, it was, that the shell was moving because the, it was swelling and the turtle was breathing, but it was actually the thousands of maggots that yeah. were in the turtle's body. Yeah. that we're making the shell fragments move. Yeah. That That's, is what we see on a regular basis. Yeah, and you post a lot of these on the Facebook page. Um, you'll post photos, which I, you know, they, they may be Not the boring ones. I don't no, post the boring But you'll tell the stories of some of the more crazy things that have happened. And I, I remember the, the two turtles that had been chained together by some idiot and, and came in and... Uh, so I'm actually, I'm looking over the laptop because that chain and padlock is still up here. Yeah. Yeah, that one particularly struck me as being, you know, just crazy. I mean, what, 
it's it's probably more just ignorance than maliciousness but sometimes the maliciousness comes out and um like i said i couldn't do what you do and i have nothing but the greatest amount of respect for you um Thank you. And, and also for being available to everybody because uh just a little bit i learned about what you do made me realize how much i didn't know and it's very similar to when i was learning calculus and physics in college uh, the more I learned, the more I knew I had no chance of learning all of it. Um, so what's going on in the clinic today? Do you have any? Um, today, uh, because of course, food is our bi biggest expense, having all of these animals. <coughs> um, I am butchering a turkey out today mm -hmm. um, because we have vultures on exhibit. And thankfully, vultures are garbage disposals. And they eat about $5 worth of food every day. Mm -hmm. And so awesome. having a, a turkey donated, uh, feathers and all, was uh, was quite a boon. Um, we've had, let's see, we've got uh, we've got to do ophthalmic exam, ophthalmic exams on two barred owls and a red-tailed hawk that came in. Uh, the red-tailed hawk came from not too far from uh, the nature preserve. It actually came from over uh, Tucker area. Mm. And while he looks absolutely gorgeous, his pupils are fixed and dilated and it's all head trauma. When you scope the eyes, they look fantastic, except he's blind as a bat. So um, we do a lot, we're able to do a lot here and we have lots of experience in various situations. If only they could talk, it would make it much easier. But this particular case, I consulted with our avian veterinarian and she and I went back and forth trying to figure out what may be causing this because he was not showing signs of poisonings or anything else like any neurological damage, except for the eyes not functioning. And uh, so we have figured out it is likely inflammation of the optic nerve where it crosses over and enters the back of the eye. So we changed the medication around and he has to get another exam today to ensure that the new medication is working some. Mm -hmm. um, we were hoping to live prey test one of our red shouldered hawks that was transferred to us from a local vet clinic. Um, they'd had him for about a week and said, there's something wrong with him, but we're not sure what. And we got him and went, well, he's blind in his right eye. <laughs> yeah. so that, that would explain it. So he's been uh, on medication for that and just got moved a couple days ago into our 25 foot long flight enclosure. So obviously you can't release a bird that's had any sort of head trauma or uh, wing or leg damage without ensuring it can consistently catch live prey. Right, right. So not only do uh, we rehab the predators here, but we also have to keep prey breeding here. Yeah, for, uh, yeah for that's, that's crazy. I, I had a friend once that used to feed his African gray parrot um, chicken. And I thought, man, that's, that's effed up right there. But uh, you don't butcher the turkey in front of the vulture, do you? No, I will not. As, as you know, we do have some wild vultures that have taken up on the property. And I, oh, yeah, that would be crazy. I've butchered deer out back before, and they've come down and started a tug of war on one end while I'm working on the other one. Yeah, I do recall you had a big tray full of rodents that had been chopped up, and you weighed them carefully for each animal's uh, specific meal that day. And you do these multiple times a day, I'm sure. So it's not all, you know, glory of you holding up the saved animal and releasing it into the wild. It's mostly a bunch of dirty, hard work that nobody really wants to do. It's uh, a lot of poop cleaning. A lot of poop cleaning. I was going to say that. You know, we try to keep it a family show, but um, <laughs> there's a lot of shit involved in your job that people don't know about. <laughs> well, it, for those of you who are parents, I am not of anything <laughs> human, but for those of you who are parents, you know that you can always tell how your child is based on the texture, the smell, the color of poop. That's it is wonderful. the same with animals. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, sorry. I was drifting off and thought there about and maybe my wife is ill right there. But um, so um, you have been featured in about a million awesome, legit publications this year. I think you're in the New York Times um, and you've done, I'm sure, videos for different groups and different promotional organizations. Um, what is the dumbest question people always ask you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness. Or if you don't want to answer that, what is the most common question that people like to ask you about what you do? Um, it sounds like fun. How do I get started? Hey, guilty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is the most common question. Not the stupidest. That is the most common one. 
Um, and I'm quite lucky in that as, as a licensed wildlife rehabilitator, I work in a clinic because the, my job description includes wildlife rehabilitation. Um, for those who are not aware, in the United States, um, you cannot charge for your services as a licensed wildlife rehabilitator. Did not know that. Not, you can't charge a dime. You can ask for donations and a lot of folks set up um, nonprofits so they can get the tax deduction uh, capabilities for, for their donors. But- um, do again. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, nonprofit team. No, the, uh, the state of Georgia is an awfully large state and um, there are only three centers in the entire state. Um, here at Chattahoochee Nature Center, there's a WARE out in Lithonia. And then there's the sea turtle center, uh, Dr. Terry Norton's rehab center down on Jekyll. All other licensed rehabilitators in Georgia do this from their homes. And so- Really? Wow. Yeah. I had no Including, idea. you know, uh, Nancy, Songbird yeah. Rehabber Extraordinaire. Right. Who, thankfully, she's trying to get a center started. So that would be fantastic. Yeah. But most rehabbers, because again, I'm covered by the nature center. So it makes it much easier for me. But those home-based rehabilitators have to pay for all vet bills, all food, all caging costs, everything out of their own pocket. Right. right. So there's only three wildlife rehabilitation centers commercially ran in the entire state. In the entire state. And you are not Songbird certified or whatever, right? Or you are certified, yeah, but I'm, you don't do them there. Yeah. My staff and I are licensed only for birds of prey, reptiles, and we do amphibians. They're actually not in an area that you can get a license in, but we do get the occasional bullfrog, bullfrog clipped with a weed whacker or things like that. Right. Well, I remember when I was there, there was a snapping turtle in a giant tub that the turtle shell was bigger than your entire upper body. And somehow you were wheeling it around like it was nothing. And that was a little scary to me too. Um, Whenever it's snapping turtle season, i.e. they start coming in for rehab, we all start working on our uh, forearm muscles. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Braver you than, than I will ever be on that one. Um, and then our, our friend Nancy uh, does songbirds from her home. And I'm, we met with her last month about being more formal and getting some land. And Sunlit Earth is going to be all involved in that as well as a sponsor. Hopefully. Wonderful. Um, and then the place down on the coast, now I've been there that, do they do any birds of any kind? They just do turtles. They do, they do reptiles, but they also do shorebirds. So awesome. herons, egrets, things like that. Awesome. One, of the, one of the big challenges besides being able to afford to be a rehabber is if you are doing birds of any sort that are native to the United States. So anything covered under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, you not only have to be licensed by the Department of Natural Resources, you also have to be licensed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife and you have to build caging for each species that you're going to work with to federal guidelines. Oh. So for instance, there are only a few of us in the state licensed to rehabilitate eagles, vultures, and osprey. And that's because you have to have a flight cage that's at least 100 feet long, 20 feet wide, 16 feet high. Most HOAs are not going to no, let that happen. No, that's beyond the capability of an individual. And luckily, Chattahoochee Nature Center sees the value in that. And uh... You know, I, I did not know that. Is that is that common in a an average state in the U.S.? Do you know? Is it normal to have one just one or two centers? Usually, there for a state the size of Georgia, there would be four or five. Mm -hmm. um, in re, in regard to Michigan, um, they've got a couple of really good ones up there. Minnesota, of course, has the Raptor Center in Minnesota. But um, most of the others, most of the other states that I'm familiar with, the home based rehabbers will come together in a center that, oh, I see. and so it's a little bit different where you everybody gets together and if somebody has 14 juvenile groundhogs this person will take all the juveniles while this one takes all the infants and things like that so to make it a little more streamlined and cost effective then. exactly yeah that's more interesting information you know every time i talk to you you're such a humble person um and and a private person really maybe people don't realize that but you're very private also and it it, uh, something new and astounding comes out pretty much every time I run across you. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's always a joy to uh, see you and Roddy walking down the street when I'm going over to the nature preserve because you've got some great story that I don't even know about and I get to hear it. Um, well, I've lived there off and on almost 50 years. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, which reminds me, uh, I don't think anyone 
or most people don't have any idea what a wonderful life and what a really uh, exciting uh, and just a, just an unusually cool life that you have led. Um, your father, and of course I'm a military veteran, and you, you mentioned to me that your father was an army officer uh, intelligence and that you guys, you're an army rep and you've moved around a lot in your, uh, in your youth. Can you tell us about some of the, the awesome places that you've lived and where you got your schooling initially and, and how that may have affected, you know, your career choice? Well, um, my parents, ironically enough, were born and raised Atlanta. Which, um, hard <laughs> That's to really them. exotic, Kathy. We're not very <laughs> prolific. I actually went to the same high school my parents did <laughs> but, and the same elementary school my dad went to. But um, when, as, as you were saying, dad was, dad was military. When he got back from Vietnam, he said, I'm never putting on a uniform again, which he put on a uniform again. Right, right. <laughs> and um, in 86, we started traveling again. Um, we went to uh, Monterey, California for to the Defense Language Institute for six, six weeks in preparation to move to Germany for three years. Um, moved back from Germany to Atlanta. We kept bouncing back to Atlanta. Um, lived in Washington State. I and you're a teenager there. at that time, right? In Germany? I'm sorry? You're just becoming a teenager about that time, right? Uh, when we moved back from Germany, I was 16. Yeah. We moved there when I was 13. And everybody wow. said, oh, what a great place to live. It's such an educational and cultural experience. Yeah. But let me tell you, when <laughs> you think Germany, you think Munich or Bavaria, you know, Bavaria <laughs> something like that. We lived in what's called a remote site, <laughs> which it was northern Germany, 20 minutes from the Dutch border. Um, I went to an international school that was an hour and a half bus ride each way. Mm. I went to school in Dusseldorf. Um, if there was an ice storm, uh, I might not get home until 10 or 11 o'clock at night from school and then have to be ready at six the next morning to leave. Um, there was no American school there. There was no military post, so to speak, army post, with the exception of a 10 story carpet factory that the US Army was renting. Right. So my next door neighbors growing up in the cultural and educational experience was literally an abattoir across the street and a house that was built in and barn in like the 1500s, a pasture and a functioning windmill that still ground corn and meal. Awesome, man. So I did get to travel to 12 countries in the three years I lived there. But let me tell you, as a 13 year old, before the internet existed for our public, <laughs> it was a little isolating. So there was no mall nearby. You weren't meeting cute boys or anything like that. Lord, no. <laughs> there, and to be honest with you, the gas station had two pumps, the hotel in town had four rooms total. And there were more people buried in the cemetery than citizens in the village. So, <laughs> so you were in the middle of the woods also. Excitement, let me tell you. <laughs> well, that'll shape your life, you know. That's probably probably has something to do with the shaping and maybe your contact with nature. I mean, I'm assuming that was in the middle of the woods, right? It was literally in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, it was all farmland and woods. Um, you actually had to take out insurance for sugar beet damage on your cars um, <laughs> because the sugar beets, the big ones, would fall off the tractor wagons and shatter your windshield. <laughs> but uh, growing up, um, mom and before Germany, mom and dad, I'm an only child, we would go camping up in the mountains of North Georgia every about every three, third weekend or so. And so dad was very big on teaching me. Well, when I say survival skills, it makes it sound like grab your bug out bag and go, mm -hmm. but just things like here's how to identify what's edible, what's not. This is edible, it tastes horrible, but if you need to eat it, you mm -hmm. can. Day lilies. Oh. When they're, they're edible, but they taste horrible. <laughs> uh, also little tricks like um, don't ever harvest any berries or fruit lower than your knees. And it took me years to f find out and actually ask him why. I just took that to heart. And he's like, because anything lower than your knees and animals peed on. You don't right. want to eat that. <laughs> That's so, what I was thinking when he said that, but I didn't, yeah. I didn't know. <laughs> yep, so I learned to harvest high. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> no, so he taught me, <clears throat> well, taught me a lot of, the natural world around me um because they grew up in in the area and then i'd come home after you know catching crawdads and things like that i'd come home and go to school in decatur and none of the none of my classmates none of my friends knew anything about crawdads or hawks or yeah. you know maple samras or anything like that and so as i got older i realized that you can ask 
any child about koala bears, pandas, kangaroos, they'll talk for hours about them. But if you ask about the gray tree frog that lives in their backyard, they don't know a thing about it. Right. You know, I've noticed that a lot too, Catherine. That's a really good point because I have a lot of friends that are young, that are, that are grossed out by a possum or, you know, they have this innate fear of these creatures that are just all over the yard and they've been living with all their lives. And have, right. And it's just because they know nothing about them. That's because, a great point. Everybody always asks why I don't work at a zoo. And I'm like, well, zoo is exotic, but exotic is now commonplace for us. You know, back when zoos became popular, our grandparents and grandpa great grandparents were so tied to the natural world around them that they knew about the red tailed hawks and the Cope's gray tree frogs and the crawdads and things like that. And the exotic animals truly were exotic to them. And now roles are completely reversed, which is why I have pretty much dedicated my career to studying native wildlife, assisting native wildlife in doing education, um, which took me to University of Georgia, um, not Bulldog. necessarily because I already lived here, but because the Institute of Ecology was founded by Eugene Odom. And Odom is a was a phenomenal naturalist and one of the most humble men I've ever worked with, ever had the opportunity to, uh, to spend time with. And so I did my undergraduate in zoology and um, because some of the programs that are available nowadays, like wildlife forestry, that didn't exist in the 80s and 90s. Right. So my bachelor's is in zoology with an emphasis on marine sciences. I did um, jellyfish research down in Key Largo in December, which was great getting away from the ice in Georgia. Yes, um, yes. And what year did you graduate from UGA? I'm sorry? When did you graduate from UGA with your bachelor's? With my bachelor's, I graduated in 95. Uh -huh. And then I taught, um, I was looking for a job with DNR, and that's when one of the first government uh, hiring freezes hit. Yeah. So. I got in for an interview and then the job disappeared. Okay. So I became a long-term substitute teacher to Cab County for science in German. Um, wait, wait, science in the language German? Yes. Or science and German? Science and German. Okay. So okay. I did teach some <laughs> classes here at the Nature Center in German. <laughs> <laughs> That's and, awesome, man. That's another one of those tidbits that you've kind of kept hidden from me, but that's awesome. So I did that for a couple of years and realized that a bachelor's degree is not going to get me anywhere. I really didn't want to do a PhD right off because at that point in the late 90s, that meant you were going to sit on a board of advisors or you're going to be a professor, neither of which really interested me at the time. So I went back and did a master's in, I say marine sciences, but when I say that people always think dolphins and whales and jellyfish. But it was actually microbial ecology and molecular biology. <laughs> so when I say I studied in situ bacterial studies, nitrogen cycling, and you know, they're just like, you what? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I looked at clean water, dirty water bacteria. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, I'll never, never look under a microscope again. I'm so sick of this after getting my master's degree. And right there over my shoulder is the microscope I use. <laughs> All I was going to say, right here is my microscope, too. <laughs> blood work, fecal samples, things like that. Right, right, right. But at least I'm not counting bacterial cells anymore. Yeah, that seems like it could be tedious, but important. I'm sorry? I said tedious, but very important. Yes, yes, indeed. So, so you got your master's, and then what, What? Um, I know we, we talked about this once before, but what brought you to the Chattahoochee Nature Center? So while I was actually, um, strangely enough, how things intersect, while I was the high school teacher Monday through Friday, I was the part-time naturalist in the education department at the Nature Center on uh, Saturdays and Sundays. Uh -huh. And one of the classes that I, uh, that I was teaching, a uh, little boy was there with his dad and come to find out that dad happened to be the head of the Department of Marine Sciences at UGA and <laughs> nice. said, I would really like for you to apply to my program. And at that time, I didn't realize that the Marine Sciences Department had just broken away from the microbiology department there. So they were really wanting to get some, some fresh blood in. Right. And so ended up applying, to, applying for that. Continued working here part-time in the ed department the entire time I did my graduate degrees, graduate degree. And then when I graduated um, with my master's, 
the wildlife director, uh, the wildlife position opened up and the uh, executive director of the nature center at the time said, we would really like you to apply for this position. Mm. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I'm not qualified for it. I don't have any of my licenses. And she's like, nobody else did before they were hired either. You can <laughs> 18 years later, here I am, still in the nature center, running the wildlife department. That is incredible, man. That's, that's uh, you know, my wife was at UGA at the same time, uh, and uh, she was not in biology. She was a lot, it doesn't matter. But, um, you know, we, we've had a, a lot of things where, you know, either I or my wife have been doing the same thing you were doing. So, and it's a small town, and you were born here, and I was born here. And uh, it's strange, because I've been around the world like you have, and then, you know, here we come back in here, and we've got these great stories. I wish more people... Uh, traveled a lot more and got exposed to a lot more uh, education because then we'd all be a lot better off. Um, Alexandra or Connie or, um, and, oh, when Catherine, how long have you been working at the Chattahoochee Nature Center? Uh, it's been in a paid position? 18 years in August uh, that I've run the department and I was part-time for six and a half before that. Do you have a throne? Have they made you a throne and a sort of a crown and a scepter that you hold on a daily basis? Or? No, but they have given me a couple extra clean t-shirts to wear now. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And, uh, you know, before I even met you, I was doing solar astronomy uh, outreach programs there mm -hmm. for that yearly thing they had. And I did a couple of lectures there. My, even my director from Kosovo, Pranvera, and I did a lecture there while you were probably sitting in the building next door on solar astronomy so it's just weird how you know all these things come together i guess if you live long enough in this town you meet everybody i, I think you're right about that <laughs> at some point um rebecca and at all did anyone have any questions you'd like to ask uh catherine or any comments you'd like to make can i ask a quick question of course, of course. <laughs> um what is your most memorable rescue whether it turned out well or whether it turned out bad what most sticks in your mind? Um, ooh, we we've had a, we've had a few unusual ones that we we didn't think we we're gonna have any chance of survival. But I will tell you that we had a red-tailed hawk come in. Um, we get these red-tailed and red-shouldered hawks about once every, well, actually about two a year, where they perch on uh, the the methane chimneys at landfills because most of the landfills in the U.S. have not learned to recapture the methane from the decaying garbage and use it to power it. <laughs> Instead what they do is they have a pilot light going and then they'll burn off the methane oh. from the uh, garbage and it shoots a flare right up. Yeah. But birds of prey love to perch on those chimneys because it gives them a beautiful aerial view of all the rats and mice running through the landfill. Yeah. And when the when the chimney goes off or when the pilot light goes off the bird usually gets one wing beat down as it starts to take off and it the flame burns all of its primary and secondary wing uh wing feathers its tail often burns on the feet and we had one that came in that had just pretty much second degree burns all on the feet it looked like a porcupine like a bird turned into a porcupine and we had that bird for over a year in rehab. We got the, the wounds healed up fine on the feet after some time, but we had to wait for every one of those feathers to molt in. And this bird never lost the notion that humans are horrible and they want, it wants to kill us. And it was the feistiest red tail that we've worked with in years. And you know, if you get hit in the face with a normal wing, it's a little painful. If you get one that's nothing but spikes hitting you in the face. Um, it leaves a nice little welt across it. And we were all very happy to wave goodbye to that bird when it was able to be released. Um, with unusual cases, uh, we had a red-shouldered hawk found in a cardboard box next to somebody's patio it had, uh, during an ice storm, which are few and far between in Georgia, but we always get the crazy cases when they come in. And this bird honestly looked like it had been shellacked. We had no idea what the chemical was that was on it. Um, it was purple. It smelled like petroleum. We'd never seen anything like it. None of the typical uh, feather cleaning and degreasing tricks made a dent in this stuff. And actually it was thanks to our neighborhood Facebook page. Uh, we have a lot of contractors and builders in the neighborhood and I posted a description in a photo of the substance and like three people right off went, that's Red Guard. It's used to waterproof shower liner pans. 
Mm. So I contacted the manufacturer Red Guard, and they said the only thing that could dissolve it was acetone. Mm. And I said, this bird is covered head to toe in it. We ended, so obviously I couldn't use acetone. We ended up with a scalpel separating each individual feather so the bird could actually move because it was nothing. The wings were just planks, rigid planks at that point. And we had to wait for that bird to molt all of its feathers out. And that one was another one that was, we were very happy to see go after all of that time with us. But luckily it wasn't nearly as defensive with humans as the red tail was. Because one of the things that we hear a lot, and this is what drives me crazy is, well, why don't you just let nature take its course? But mother nature didn't invent the automobile, the shotgun, the rat bait, the red guard, what, what we typically see. And so that, that's probably one of the most frustrating parts is when you're trying to help the animal and people are like, oh, it'll be fine. Just leave it. And it's like, um, you realize it's got bones sticking out of its body right now. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and again, you know, people are just very uh, lacking in knowledge of, of the whole thing. And you've, you've said that in many different ways while we're talking. And uh, again, you know, the education that CNT does or tries to do uh, is, is helpful and we need a lot more of it. Um, I'm and good then, with ignorance because ignorance can be fixed with knowledge. Stupidity yeah. is its own thing, and that's what I do not have the patience for. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. I don't like the malicious uh, harming of, of anything, especially animals. Um, wow. Uh, Connie, did you did you unmute for a reason? Or? Just in case I wanted to say something. I, <laughs> I did not. Hi, <laughs> The only thing, um, so I'm a retired nurse and I moved to Atlanta right out of nursing school to work in the emergency room at Grady. <laughs> did oh, you know boy. what I'm talking about? And so I <coughs> did know what you were talking about, maggots included. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah, that, that is, there are a few things, uh, clostridium, maggots, Parvo that you can smell from a room away, and before you even see the case or the patient, you know what you're walking into. Oh, you know, everybody that's, no, oh, go ahead, Tom. You weren't close to grossing me out by any stretch. <laughs> if, you did, if you did Grady ER nursing, <laughs> no, you could gross me out sooner, I'm sure. And uh, Alexander is a, a, can, a cancer researcher, right? Uh, yeah. She, so she's, oh, wow. she's been around some gross stuff, too. Yes, <laughs> and, Rebecca, stuff. and Rebecca is married to Dwayne, so she's been around some gross things too. All right, Rebecca? Ah, <laughs> uh, you can be nice to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, Although, wow, this... I, say, I did work a, um, at a medical school and doing photography and graphics, so I was always doing like photographs of the pro sections and Mm. Um, my, my very first project, the neurobiology professor brought down three human brains and I held them while we sliced them and none of that bothered me, but I'm going to go ahead and take my earphones off TVs. now. <laughs> <laughs> he even gathered a motley crew for this week, didn't he? <laughs> you guys need to get a room, man. <laughs> that stuff, you know, that's crazy. So you held a brain in your hand. Is that right, Rebecca? Three, yeah, three, three hundred times the human brain yeah. um, while he sliced them. And then um, like the first time we did that, then I had a photograph and we were doing a multimedia program for the first year med students. And um, it looked like he had a big cake knife. <sighs> Although he's like, I'm like, that's your, like your grandmother's cake knife. And he's like, no, I swear it's a brain knife, but it left kind of ridges in it. That's a brain so, knife. Um, Is that what he said? <laughs> <laughs> Great. So we tried to actually create, we tried to engineer this brain slicer because I wanted the slices really nice and smooth. And um, Where's the mute practiced with tofu, <laughs> but then you got to the brain stem and it didn't work well. Okay. All right. Okay. So uh, All right, well, that's not <laughs> you three uh, highly accomplished and extraordinary women. You four highly accomplished and extraordinary women are 10 times the man I am, let's just say. I couldn't do any of that stuff. And I'm supposed to be the tough guy. Uh, well, I think I'm okay with people and and like the dissections, but I get a little upset when it's animals. Yeah, I think that's a, so, common, a common thread. Uh, 
than a lot of people. Yeah, I've had today. some, like, unsubscribe to some Facebook pages because mm. Dwayne would come by and I'd be tears <laughs> running down my face. Right. Um, I've, I've got a friend that does some rescue stuff with dogs and yeah. it was it was just too horrible for me to look at well you know you can you can pretty much trust animals i mean they're they're going to do what they're going to do even if it's not pleasant to you sometimes but you know with humans um yeah there a lot of them are are have an ulterior motive and you can't trust a lot of people outside of your inner circle so i think it's a common thread that that people feel a lot more grief when they see an innocent animal um, in pain or injured uh than they than they would for for a human uh <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's a rough world right now, but animals uh, has has allowed us all to uh, get a little solace in a uh, forest of misfortune that we're all living in now. Um, and and Catherine uh, exceptionally stands out uh, all the time because you know she's actually doing the grunt work and the hard work, and um, you know it's it's a great thing. And I wish I had the words for it, but I'm just very appreciative. of you and what you do and you taking time out to be on our show this week uh, to do that so i do have a question for Catherine. um so i'm right across scott boulevard on the other side of medlock so i'm in the medlock facebook group and come go, go to clyde shepherd and see all the posts but i don't know if you saw that message on next door about <laughs> somebody was posting about the aggressive owl and they wanted to know how to have it like relocated or something. I am not on next door because I get tagged in so much on Facebook. I didn't want to. Uh, yeah, I understand. Before. Yeah. And I, I don't even know if we're do. on there. So I didn't want to say, call Catherine. Because <laughs> <laughs> no. I know you get overwhelmed with it. But I'm just curious, like, what would you tell someone like that? Because, and enough people were like, no, you can't relocate an owl. Right. And maybe there's a nest nearby. And. So um, the first thing I say is that it's highly unusual for any wild animal to be aggressive. It can be apparently it's grouping people as they like go in their door. Right, right. So that tells me that there is likely it, it's not baby season yet for owls, thankfully, but likely a food source that it is trying to guard and it's looking at the humans as competition, trying to take that food source. So mm -hmm. they're treating the, the humans as they would any other animal coming in trying to steal their supper. Mm. And uh, so it, you know, simple things you can do. I know a lot of times people just throw an umbrella up and if the bird's gonna dive bomb, it's gonna hit the umbrella. Um, motion detector lights work great. <laughs> um, okay. The main thing to keep in mind is it's always only going to be a short-term situation. Um, once the owl finishes whatever meal is there, um, we've actually seen them come down on uh, squeaky toys in, in the yard where dogs and dogs play because they see, you know, it's a little squirrel squeaky toy. And to the juvenile owl, it's like, oh, look at this meal that's not moving. So uh -huh. they're just kind of learning the ways of the world and what they should be scared of and what they shouldn't. And, um, for the most part, they all think they're like 16 year old boys with way too much ax body, you know, body <laughs> sit on and they're invincible. So uh, they, they will be schooled very quickly by some of the other raptors and other animals in, in the area. You know, I read somewhere where only one in five raptor, I think maybe you told me that, make it to their first birthday because of this. Right. It's about, about 10%, 10 to 15% make it to their first birthday. Um, but a lot of it is because, for instance, with, uh, say, barred owls, uh, they have to eat anywhere from 8 to 12 percent of their body weight every night just to maintain weight, um, not even to grow. And those lizards and mice and baby rabbits aren't going to come out on a driving rainstorm at night. So if their prey doesn't come out, they don't come out. So for the juveniles, which is anything that's not sexually mature yet. So for the teenagers, um, they could, if we have three, four nights of horrendous weather, they don't have the fat reserves packed on that the adults do. And just, you know, three, four nights of storms can be fatal for them. Yeah, and I remember you taught me how to measure the uh, crop with your fingers when you get the bird in to feel on a scale of one to five, I think it was. Yeah, feel the keel, not the crop, but the keel. Oh, I'm sorry, the keel. Yeah, see, yeah. that's how little I know. Uh, feel the keel and the amount of, 
meat over the keel gives you an idea of the health of the bird or how long it's been injured or something like that. Right. Cool. Um, Catherine, I know you have a million things to, to go back and do and you've given us an hour of your time. And again, I'm really, really grateful for that. Um, thank you so much. You are most welcome. Thank you. You're right. I do have something I need to get to right now. Okay, well, go ahead and you feel free to sign off. We're just going to wrap the show up, but but um, thanks a million Thank and you. I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thanks. thanks. Nice meeting the, the three Bye. of y'all. So next week's show, thanks, Kathy. Uh, next week's show is going to be almost as equally, well, it'll be equally or even maybe even, it'll be awesome. Let's put it that way. Uh, we have CNN meteorologist, uh, CNN International, and Alexander, you've probably seen this person on your television screen <laughs> or in the airport at Heathrow, maybe. Or, but Karen McGinnis um, <sighs> uh, will be on our show, and she's an avid owl photographer and stalker, and we met at Clyde Shepard, and Karen has the greatest owl call you've ever heard, let me tell you. She makes this call, and the owls will come from miles around to come to her. Um, and we all met at the Owl Box <clears throat> at the Clyde Shepherd Nature Preserve a couple of years ago. So she's going to be on next week. And she's traveled all around the world taking photographs of different types of owls. And uh, she also shamed me into spending $18,000 on a camera setup because I was out there with my little rinky dinky camera. And here she shows up and just, you know, I got to compete because I'm a guy. So we're going to have a great talk about owls uh, next week on our show. So uh, thank you, Connie and Rebecca and Alexandra and those others who are on, but not with video, for joining our meeting. And we will see you next week on This Week in Birding and Nature Photography. Adios, everybody. Bye. Thank you.